This is my grandfather, also one of my best friends. Uh, we've been very close ever since I was in high school when his first wife died. And we just started hanging out and um, he shared with me a lot of things. And some of those things, I, maybe some of the stories that you guys have heard, but I, don't, I didn't know if you'd ever heard it from granddaddy. So, so here we go. But anyway, so I, got, I just got some questions to sort of lead us along. It'll be roughly chronological. But granddaddy... When did you decide you wanted to go into the hardware business? Well, I didn't decide I would go in the hardware business. Oh, this is the one that I don't know about, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was working for Sears in High Point. And the um, first work that um, High Tire Company, recapping and re, re uh, threading tires, they don't do that anymore, I don't think, but anyhow, they did back then. And... Uh, <clears throat> Then I got a job at Sears, and I just love the retail. So they um, put me in the automotive department, and I had never been on the, I told them I'd just clean floors or, you know, a janitor or whatever they needed. He said, I don't need anybody like that. So I said, well, what do you need? He said, I need a salesman in the automotive department. And I didn't even have an automobile. I hardly knew anything about the automotive business, the automobile. But um, <clears throat> anyhow, they put me in there. And um, so I worked there. And um, I was 15 years old when I went to work for them. Wow. I worked for Sears for six years. But while I was working for Sears, I had an opportunity I met the vice president of uh, Sears, of the Sears Robot. There were four of them, one over the southeast, the northeast, the northwest, and the southwest. And they ran the business. Sears was the number one retail business back then. And um, of course the headquarters was in Chicago. And I met the vice president of, he came to bring the high point of all places one time. And I met him, and for some reason or another, he and I connected. And so he, he offered me to go to Chicago. And I told him, I said, look, I've never been out of the county. I said, that's like a foreign country to me. I mean, Chicago, I would never even consider going to Chicago. And um, so he said, well, it's a great opportunity for you. And I said, well, I'm turn it down. I mean, I prayed about it. I said, let me pray about it. But I, I didn't really want to pray about it. <laughs> so uh, he offered me to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Well, I went over there and stayed a week. I told him, I said, I'll go over there and stay a week, and if I like it, I'll stay, but otherwise I'm going to come home. And I went over and stayed a week, and I came home. <laughs> Well, I knew then that Sears, if I went ahead with Sears, I'd be traveling all over everywhere, and I didn't want that. I wanted to put roots down. I'm just sort of a hometown guy anyhow. So I was working in the automotive, but I, I began to think about, I, I need to get in business for myself. I don't want to travel all over the world. And... Um, so I, I knew the hardware, I knew the automotive business. I ran the service station, I, I had the automotive, all the tires, had the plumbing department, had the building supplies. And um, they advanced me along pretty well. So um, I was, I decided that I would start, uh, I would look into going into the automotive business you know, automotive supplies. And um, so I began to look around for a, lo a, a location back then. I mean, I don't know why I was sort of, you know, energetic. And I thought, well, I'll just go in the, in the automotive supply business. But um, then Sears transferred me to Greensboro. So, and I was over the hardware and other departments in, in Greensboro. And um, so then I changed my mind. I thought, and I worked for Sears for six years. And um, so I decided I'd go in the hardware business instead of 
instead of automotive. I've never told you. I've never heard that. But um, and so I was about I was 22 years old when I opened the door. Opened the Sweet Plumber in March of 1949. So that's how I started. Absolutely. So, um, tell me a little bit about one day uh, before you opened, you were on your way, you had saved some money, and you were looking at, obviously it's going to take some money to start a, your own business, and you're on your way downtown to pay some bills, and who did you meet? Okay. <clears throat> one day, I, uh, I didn't have a checking account, but I had a savings account, but I paid everything by cash. So I was, my day off, and I was living in High Point, but live, I mean, working in Greensboro with Sears, but I lived in High Point because I looked after my mother. And I've done, and I did that all my life, looked after my mother. And, um, so she was a widow. My father died when I was 14. So, um, I was going downtown to pay the light and water and do power and whatever. And I was standing on the corner, and a man came by by the name of Don Hedden. And he was a very wealthy man. He owned factories. He owned a big factory, a big factory and other, very well known, very well, very well known. And I was just standing there, and he stopped. And he said, are you going downtown? And I said, yes. And he said, well, jump in. And I got in his car, and... Um, he knew, he just knew me vaguely. I mean, he knew, he had seen me. I had, I used to work uh, people's yards, and I had worked at his white, his white truck. So um, I got in the car, and he said, what do you do? And I said, I work for Sears in Greensboro. And uh, he said, with a little pause there, and he said, well, what's your goal in law? And I said, well, I mean, you know, nobody had ever asked me that. And I said, well, that's interesting that you asked that. I said, I'd like to go into hardware business. And he said, well, what are you doing about it? And I said, well, I'm saving some money. And um, he said, how much have you saved? And I told him how much I had saved. And it was a... I was seven thousand dollars that I had saved. I didn't have a car, and I was very frugal, extremely frugal. And um, so he said, um, uh, "But that time we were downtown, and I was getting out of the car. He was director of High Point Savings and Trust, and he said I park around in the back, so I'll let you out here." And I got out of getting out of the car, and he said, "If you want to start a business." Go ahead and start it, and I'll put up your money. And I had been praying that the Lord would, would give me, you know, help me along. And I said, Mr. Head, and I said, are you serious? And he said, I'm dead serious. Well, so I went to, Sears was moving out of, uh, out of the store next to the O. Henry Hotel downtown. This was before shopping centers, no shopping centers at all. It was even before pegboard. I mean, we didn't even, pegboard wasn't invented. <laughs> and and uh, I went to the man that owned the store. I didn't know him, Mr. Fleet, owned the store that Sears was renting. And they were building a new store over on Eugene Street. Y'all don't remember anything about that. But. So um, I had been helping set up that new store. So I went to him and I asked him if I could rent that store that Sears was moving out of. And he sort of laughed at me and he said, you know, he said, how old are you? And I told him, he said, look, I've got everybody wanting, big companies wanting this store. Because, see, that was it. Downtown was it. I mean, you got a store downtown, that was all. But he said, um, and so he didn't, he said, I can't give you any encouragement on that because he said, I've got so many people wanting that store. 
the Sears hadn't turned it over to him. They were going to be turning it over in about three months. So um, I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, just take my name. And if you, uh, if you want, uh, if you would, just call me if you, if you change your mind. He said, well, I want to know one thing. He said, do you have enough money to open up a store? And I said, well, I don't. But I said, uh, uh, Don Hedden in High Point is backing me. He said, you know Don Hedden? And I said, oh, yeah. We're buddies. <laughs> and, and he said, and he's backing you? And I said, he is. And um, so about three or four days later, it was on a Friday night. I think maybe it was on about a Tuesday I went to him. And on Friday night, a Friday, he called me and he said, can you meet me and my wife? at Mason Jolene at uh, 7 o'clock or whatever time it was. And I said, I'll be there. And he gave me this story. He said, if, he said, all of my life, I'm 64 years old. But he said, all of my life, I have, I have wanted to be in the hardware business. He said, that's been a dream of my life. And he said, you know, I've been talking to my wife, and he said, I know this is very unusual, but he said, if you would let me go in business with you, uh, he said, uh, I, you can have the store that you want. You can have that store, which was the prime store. And uh, he said, I'll put up the money, and we'll go, fit, we'll go in 50-50. And, uh, of course, I told him how much I had to put in it. So I thought, well, I don't even know this man. So I checked on him, and um, and uh, he came out good. So we went in business together in 1949. Wow. We went. We okay. had a lawyer to draw up the plans, and he told me. He said, "I said, you know, he was that old. I was 22. He was 64." And um, so we made the we made arrangements that if he when he he said probably five or six years is about all I can do it, but he said I just want to do it, and I said okay. So we sort of drew up the plan that I would buy him out when he retired. So that's how I got into it. Yeah. So now you and I give the Lord all the credit because that was not anything really, but it was unusual. So you opened the doors, and did people just start flooding in? No. <laughs> <laughs> you were three doors down from what? From Phipps Hardware. Oh, my goodness. And uh, four doors, I guess. And Phipps Hardware was a big, the biggest hardware store in Greensboro. This is when hardwares were big in Greensboro. I mean, yeah. there were nine hardware, seven hardware stores. And um, Phipps was the biggest. They had about, I don't know how many employees, but it was, it was a big store. It had three floors to it. So, um, and you, had, you just had three employees, didn't you? <laughs> I started with three employees. <laughs> and um, that was in 1949, and it didn't flood in. I mean, I advertised, and of course we had customers coming in, but I was used to a lot of customers. My goodness, it was just, it was bad. So what did you do to drum up business? So every day in the afternoon, late afternoon, I would get out and I would go house to house. I'd pick a street. I'd go house to house and introduce myself and fleet plumber. And I said, if you need a garden hose or a hoe or, you know, anything for the house, I said, uh, I would appreciate you coming to Fleet Plumber and trying me. You know, and I just got no people. And I did this every day for several years. I went house to house. I knew more people. And one of the things that I learned, when they would come in the store, and I trained myself to do this, to call them by name. Hey, Rex. 
how you doing, Rex? You know, instead of just, hi, how are you? Appreciate you coming in. I say, hey, Rex, thanks for coming in. Hey, Linda, you know, I mean, I was trying to uh, make it family and uh, personal, and people love that. People like to be called by their name. And um, when you go in a store and they call your name, I might. But it's it's important. And that's how I started. And didn't you say if, if you did go buy a house and they wanted a hammer the next night, you'd show up with the hammer? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They said, well, I need so-and-so now. And I said, well, I'll bring it to you tomorrow. And I delivered it myself. Yeah. <laughs> really? Oh, really? Can I put something out? Sure. That I just remember working with Ryan and uh, Will. I hadn't worked with you that much, but I worked with Ryan. Ryan told me a story. I hope he remembers. But Ryan said he got the letter. A customer came into your store and bought a lawnmower. Back then, it was more of credit. coming in credit, and <clears throat> he didn't sign no papers or nothing. The man just come in every day or every week or something like that and paid his bill and everything else and stuff. And at the end of when he made his last payment, he wrote Mr. Plumber a letter. I wish I had it with me. I have it. You have it? Well, okay. Well, I know, I know Ryan showed it. Ryan said, this is how Grandpa used, this is how business was conducted at that point. He said, I did a big said, credit we, business. He said, big credit, and he said he never asked anything. And said, this man, at the end of the time, when he came here, he said, They paid me Plumber. 50 cents down and 50 cents a week. <laughs> at the end of it, he wrote you a What did he say at the end? It says, what? It was the last daughter of the black guy. The letter, he said, Mr. Plummer, show do appreciate you giving me the mower on credit. Here's here's the last daughter, and here she comes. Or something like that. Here she comes. <laughs> I wish I had it. I'd show it to you. I've got that left. <laughs> so, Grenda, you also did some pretty innovative stuff when you first started out. You, uh, what did you do with the TV? Well, it was 1949, and TV was just starting. You know, people didn't. A lot of people didn't have TVs. But they were selling. I mean, they were selling TVs, and, and um, it was going along pretty good. So the t uh, channel two was just across, uh, just a block away from me, and um, so I went to channel two, and I told them, I said, I'd like to have a half-hour program, but you got to give me a deal. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, you, television is new and, and all, but I want a half-hour program. So I had a half-hour program once a week, and I'd get on there and demonstrate different things that we had. And um, I had, I, I bought, I put, I, I put in the first uh, rubber-based paint that was ever sold in Greensboro. And that was spread satin by a Glidden company. And I would demonstrate that because you can wash it out with water. See, never before that, everything was oil. And, you know, there's a lot of mess to that. Well, I'd, I'd get in there and paint uh, wall, uh, wallpaper, old wallpaper books. I'd get, uh, gather those up from people. And I'd paint them, you know, and then I'd wash it out and show them how they could wash it out and how beautifully it it um, it covered, and then that was dried. I'd put mark on pencils and and the crayons on it. You take a rag and wipe it off and save, show them how it would do. Man, we started selling paint, <laughs> and I bought the first rotary lawnmower that was ever sold in Greensboro. And I found out about it, and so I wrote the company or called them. I forgot. And I started buying that lawnmower. It was a rubber tire, a balloon tire, and it just two wheels. And you had to be real careful to push it straight because if you dipped it or something, you know, you'd cut into it. But so I would demonstrate that, and I'd go out. Uh, the people would come in the store and they'd look at it, and I'd say, well, "Look, I'll come out there and mow your yard." I'd go out there and mow the yard, a part of it, and um, show them how it worked. And I started selling rotary lawnmowers. And I did a lot of, uh, I got a lot of things that like that. 
that I just demonstrated. So that's how I. But I was, I was, I had a half-hour program. Yeah, we were innovative. We were the first on TV, the first with that paint, and the first with uh, a lot more. So, um, so tell me about Mr. Fleet. How was he? How did it go in terms of the management style when when you guys first started? Tell me about Mr. Fleet. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> the first time we were going down to Charlotte to a. Uh, uh, to, to a, they, were, they had a big uh, um, showing there, and we were going down to Charlotte. This is we had we had just started just started the mine, and um, we went and I didn't have a car, but he had a Buick. So he said, "Charlie, you drive." So we pulled out of the parking lot, and uh, there was a. a uh, a light there right in front of the hotel and um, so I stopped and the light had just changed he reached over and turned off the switch of the car this was the and I said what are you doing and he said whenever even then the lights just changed he said save that gas <laughs> <laughs> well we went on, and we were we were going to Charlotte, and I forgot where we were. But anyhow, we had a long hill to go down, and he reached over and cut it off again. We, there, that was no, no power steering, of course. And um, I said, "What in the world again?" He said, "Don't coast down the hill." <laughs> so we got down to the bottom of the hill, and I started up the car, and we went on. And I thought, "What am I getting into?" I mean, I never. I've never seen anything like this. We got down there, and we worked, and about 3 o'clock, I'd say, I said, let's stop and get a Coke. He said, you drink Coca-Cola's? I said, I do. And um, he said, Charlie, water will do just as good, and said, you can save a nickel. It was a nickel. That was when they were little bottles, you know. So um, I said, look, I said, Mr. Fleet, I said, I'm going to drink a Coca-Cola. I mean, I thought I got to put my foot down somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, you know, he was—he—he he, um, he had a lot of eccentric. He was very eccentric about a lot of things, but I, uh, we got along. We got along good. And, uh, you said he gave you pretty free way with the management. And stuff. Well, he knew nothing about the hardware. He knew nothing about anything, and so, but he wanted to be in there, and he went with me on the mine trips. And, but I had free way to buy what I knew would sell. Yeah. yeah, and tell me about how he would save money in the store. Okay, when we had the store that was a uh, higher ceiling than this, and the light would, when the sun was beaming in here, he would cut off all the lights. <laughs> um, and as the sun would move to the back, we had lights in the back. He would go around cutting off lights because he said, the sun's coming in here, we don't need this electricity. And I had to fight him all the time because it would, I'd have to go around turning on lights. He said, it's still coming in? I said, look, we need light in this store. <laughs> and, uh, but we did have sort of a, uh, we battered back and forth on that. I mean, he was... He told me one day, he said, Charlie, what, uh, uh, that was back when we only had safety razors, you know, just the regular razor, the safety razors. And he said, um, and something came up, and I said, I got to go get some razor blades. He said, Charlie, he said, I only use one a year. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you can sharpen them. <laughs> and I said, well, how in the world do you do that? And he showed me, he takes a glass and puts a, uh, puts a, <laughs> the razor blades in there, and it sharpened it. He said, I, I, never, I never did try. <laughs> <laughs> so you're I mean, he was interesting. He was interesting. I loved him, though. He, he really was a, I liked him. So you were in business with Mr. Fleet for about five years. Five years. Right. So the time came. And he had a little stroke, and he said, Charlie, it's time for me to step out. Step out. So this is about 1955. 
54. 54, 55. So you guys had drawn up the papers to, uh, you know, to, to transfer the business. Yeah. And then what happened after that? I'm really ashamed to tell this, but I will. We drew up the papers. Well, we had operating cash. And, um, and I was to buy him out. And, um, and um, we, we had arranged for me to, for him to loan me the money to buy it out. I mean, that was part of the deal. So um, uh, the bank called me. I wrote a check. I uh, was paying the bills, and I wrote checks. And the bank called me, and they said, uh, Miss Plummer said, uh, you're, you're out. Of, you don't have any money in the bank. I said, oh, yes, we have so-and-so. And he said, "Come, uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, a check has been written, to, and and all that's been taken out." Wow. So I went to the bank, and they, they sure enough, Mister Fleet had wrote, written a check, and took all of our operating cash out. And here I had these bills. And uh, I went to him and I said, what in the world? Have you, you had no, uh, uh, no authority whatsoever to take that, our operating cash. That's not in the deal. He said, well, I did it. And I, and, and, uh, I want to build a house for someone's uh, his daughter or something. And he said, I'm going to take that money out. I couldn't believe it. I went to the bank and I said, look, I said, I don't have the money. To cover this, to cover these checks. But I said, if you will cover these checks, um, you know, I'll pay it. I'll, I'll, I'll cover them as soon as I can. And so I went to my lawyer, Lawrence Hall, and I said, Lawrence, what should I do? I said, this has happened. He said, he has no authority whatsoever under your contract to take that money out of the store. And um, he said, you can sue him and get every dime of it. Well, that would have been a lot of, a lot of publicity, and I didn't want to go through all that. But I didn't know what else to do. I said, well, uh, I said, well that's just, I guess I'll have to just sue him. <coughs> and I got to the door, and I turned around, and I said, Lawrence, let me ask you something. I said, what would you do if you were in my position? He sat there for a minute. He said, Charlie, I think you can make it. He said, why don't you drop it? He said, I think you can make it. I said, well, okay, Lawrence. I said, drop it. So I would buy a hammer. I mean, I'd sell a hammer and I'd buy a hammer. <laughs> I mean, it was that tight. I mean, I would I would buy something, and as soon as I would buy ones and twos of everything, and uh, and I I did sell it. I did get out, pulled out of it. Wow. It was tough, but I pulled out of it. So that was about 1956. I mean, 1955, and you said 1956 was probably the lowest point of Fleet Plumber. You actually thought about closing it. Well, I was struggling, and it was a cold winter day. And it was uh, late in the evening, and that was. And I pulled down to the gas station. I was closing. I pulled down there. I needed some gas, and um, that was when you didn't pump your own gas. You know, you, they all, you know, they pumped it. You didn't get out and pump it. And he was pumping the gas, and I looked up and and I had told the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't see how I can make it, but I knew He'd put me in business. But I said, I don't see how in the world I can make it. And I looked up through the windshield, and I saw a blue sky about that much, just a tiny little bit in this dark grizzly. I mean, it was just very unusual. And you know, it was as if the Lord was speaking to me, this blue sky ahead. You stay in there and uh, just plug it out. And on the way home, I just said, told myself, I said, I'm going to stay in here. I saw that blue sky, and I believe the Lord is telling me, you stay in there. Mm -hmm. 
And that kept me going. And I just kept plugging along. You were at Friendly about five more years. Were they good years? I was in Downtown. there in 1965. Sorry. Yeah. And they were excellent years. They were excellent years. So the business really took off when I went to Friendly Shopping right. Center. So, I, so I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. But before we get to Friendly, we're still a little bit at Downtown. So from that day, 1956, the low day, till when you moved out to Friendly, were they good years? When you, the last couple of years at? Yeah. I operated the store down st downtown because the, my, my lease was still for two years. So I operated the store downtown, but I bought the store out at Friendly. So I had two stores going for a little while, but as soon as the lease ran out, I pulled everything from downtown and put it in, in, in uh, Friendly. So what made you decide to move? Oh, well, I knew shopping centers was was the way to go. I mean, I knew that I had to get out because, well, one thing that happened, they were building the Wachovia building on the corner, a huge building, and all of this construction, and they had a uh, covered walkway, and my store was practically blocked. <coughs> and, um, and it hurt the business terribly. I mean, that was really a struggle, and I knew I had to get out, so um, so I went to Friendly Shopping Center. Did they, they reach out to but you? But that store, well, they originally, when Friendly opened, they came to me and wanted me to open a hardware store there, and I had just bought out Mr. Flea. I didn't have the money. So I told them, I said, I would like that business. I would like, but I can't because I've... Uh, I don't have the money, and I don't. Uh, I've got a lease here. So um, Bob Pleasance took the store out there, and Bob did exceptionally well. But um, he got real. Uh, he he thought I can do this here. I can open up another store. He opened up two or three stores, and was selling. Uh, uh, and he went broke. He really overextended himself. If you just spend it to one story, it'd been all right, but he didn't. And uh, so he went bankrupt, and it was in bankruptcy. And, and Friendly came to me, and they said, we want you in Friendly. And um, so really, they had the power that nobody else could really bid on that store. Because they said, we want you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I bid, I mean, I went to the bankruptcy. And I uh, told them I was interested in it. And so I bought it out. I bought that store. And that's how I got in Friendly. So tell me about the Friendly years. Were they good years? They were real good years. Real good years. I had the floods of customers. All my old customers came right to me. I mean, they didn't. You know, so we had good years. There was one gentleman you hired during the friendly years. Did he turn out all right? Somebody named Robert or something? Yeah, yeah. And Bob had always told me, he said, look, don't ever think I'll run that hardware store because I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> 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 and uh, the last year in college, of course, he had worked there all, you know, during school and all. I mean, during the... And, uh, during college, the last year in college, he said, Dad said, this looks better and better. He said, what do you think about me coming in here? <laughs> I said, you come in here and I'll teach you everything I know. And I did, didn't I? When I told me to start selling spank, he said, oh, what? What? <laughs> Say that again. When I came to you and I said, Dad, we're going to start selling spanks. I said, oh, my. <laughs> Final days are coming soon. <laughs> but we got along real well with Bob, and we had a good time. So how long were you at Friendly? From 65 to 1989. Didn't we move here in 89? 1990. Uh, in 90. 65, that was 15 years. I was 25 years uh, at 25. No, 25 years at Friendly. 25 years at Friendly. 
But tell me briefly about the move from Friendly over here. Well, that was something. <laughs> we, uh, there was a swimming pool in this, in this store. This was a spa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that, there was a track all the way around the uh, perimeter here, and there was a spa there. I never really saw that. I mean, I mean, I did see it later, but I, I rented Bob and I rented this store, not ever coming in the side of the building, did we? Because it was padlocked, and even the owner could not open the door because it had gone into bankruptcy. So we, Bob and I, looked and looked and looked around for a location. We went lo location after location because Friendly was making us stay open on Sunday, and I would not stay open on Sunday. That's the only reason we left Friendly, was that I, I was determined we were not going to open up on Sunday. And they said either they were going to make us, and I said, no, we'll just leave. Well, anyhow, was a whole, that's a whole other story. But that's how we got away from Friendly and came here. We rented this store and finally we got the padlock off the door so we could get in here and see what was in here. The swimming pool was in here. So it took a lot of work to get it in shape. And we were, we had to do it quickly because we were leaving Friendly. And I, when we moved, the customers all came to us and said, we'll help you. We'll help you move. Some of them had trucks. They would come. I mean, it was, it was a community thing, wasn't it? People were coming in. They were hauling stuff from over there, over here, and helping us put it up, helping us set up. And... Um, it was it was quite a a community thing. We got a lot of publicity about it, mm -hmm. didn't we? More letters to the editor written about the Richard Haley News about that topic than had ever been written before. Yeah, it was all over the newspapers, and uh, most people were supporting us. So. They were mad at friendly, weren't they? Yeah. They were. But anyhow, <laughs> we came here in 1990. Well, they lost a lot of customers when the city came to that Yeah. I can't hear you. I said they lost a lot of good customers when they told y'all you had to be open. Well, they the did. Mm -hmm. They did. Was it Vernon Chapter? Yeah, Bernard Shepherd, uh, Bernard Shepherd had a, a clothing, good clothing store. He moved over to Forum Six. Four Seasons. Forum Six. I mean, Forum Six. What is that? Forum Six. Forum Six. They wanted me to move to Forum Six, but I wasn't going there. Yeah. Well, that good. was a smart move. <laughs> yeah. Well, Granddaddy, after being in in. Uh, retail for 40 years and retiring and seeing it continue on, what do you look back on on your career with the greatest satisfaction as you look back? The customers. Tell me more about I that. really love my customers. And uh, so I think, I'm, I think that was one of the greatest things that I really enjoyed the people and getting to know them and knowing their families and knowing their children as they came on. They started trading here and all. That was just, and one of the greatest things that I always enjoyed about the hardware store, we had stuff that nobody else had. We carried a lot of the perimeter stuff. I mean, there's always, you know, the high selling stuff. But a lot of people will just stay with that. But we had stuff that was slow movers, but if they couldn't find it anywhere else, they could find it here. And we got sort of a reputation, if you can't find it anywhere else, you can find it at Fleet Plumber. And um, it thrilled me to death when people come in and say, 
you know, I've looked everywhere, and here it is, you yeah. know. And uh, we have people come in from Burlington and all the surrounding areas. They said, I've heard about it. I've looked everywhere for so-and-so, and here you had it. So, you you know, that thrilled me that we could, we had stuff that nobody else had. Well, as we uh, look forward to, I don't know about another 65 years, but as many years, hopefully, as, as we can, what advice would you give to us in terms of customer service or advice in general? Love the customer. Okay. Love the customer. What do you mean? And treat them right. I mean, take care of them and, uh, and give them good merchandise at, at a reasonable price and take care of them. I mean, if they... You've got to keep that customer. That's that's your that's your number one. Your customer is your number one asset. If you don't have a customer, you don't need them to have a business. So the customer is the most important thing. That's one thing I learned. You love the customer, and uh, and not only just uh, want to treat them, but don't look at them at a dollar sign. Look at them as a person, because. Whether they want a ten cent something or a five thousand dollar, I take just as good care of one as I would the other. And a lot of people will not do that. I went in a store one day uh, and uh, was in a Gucci store or something, and I was just looking around and I asked uh, I asked the man. I said I saw something that I liked. It was in a Plate glass case, and he looked at my clothes and sized me up. And um, you know, he didn't even want to show me that. He didn't think you had the money to buy. It. Uh, what he thought he didn't. He didn't think you had the money to buy. It. No, he thought you know he's not that kind of. He, he can't buy that. I mean, listen, you never can tell what people can buy. Oh, amen to that. Uh, uh, amen to that. Right. That guy that bought that five thousand dollar grill in here to come out there outside the store that one day. He was talking to me and Dale. He was in blue jeans and overalls and didn't look like he had a pot to piss in. Yeah. And he walked on in here and met Bob a five thousand dollar check. You know, so that's that's the thing. I mean, I met two of the employees, two of the founders of RF micro devices, and one of them he came in the same way and. Mike looked at me and said, do you know who that is? I said, no, I didn't at that time. Uh, but afterwards, but he lived, he lived the same as he yeah. always has. He's never oh, changed yeah. his style. And that's the way some people are. You know, people, some people don't want you to know they got money and yeah. they don't care about it neither. Another thing is suggestive selling. I never sold anything that I didn't suggest something else. I had a big stack on the back of the register. I had light bulb, and I'd say, by the way, do you need any light bulb? And they'd say, oh, you know, I do need a, I need a, so I do, I do need some light bulb. <laughs> we said, no, they came to me one day, and this was downtown, and, the, and where I was buying them, and they said, how in the world do you sell all those light bulbs? I mean, you sell more light bulbs than the big stores and all. And I said, <laughs> It was all because I just suggested. Well, Granddad, you said you had something maybe you wanted to read. I do. Well, let's read that and we'll finish up. Because I tell you what, the Lord means everything to me. And, um, and I trust him. I came to the Lord when I was 16 years old by reading the Bible. I've now put the Bible on this because I can't I can't read the small print so I can get the font bigger here. But this is one of my favorite verses. And um it means a lot to me. Can I share it with you? Absolutely. He says, My child never this is Proverbs three. He says, My child, never forget the things I've taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years, and your life will be satisfying. 
Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. I'm going to skip a little bit here, but I love this. My child, don't lose sight of common sense. You know, you can be one of the smartest people in the world and don't have a bit of common sense. <laughs> I mean, have you seen people like that? Yeah. I mean, you can be, be smart and not have good common sense. And the Lord says, says, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them. <laughs> well, <laughs> I pray for common sense. <laughs> I don't have a lot of wisdom. I mean, a lot of education and all. But um, I do want a little common sense. <laughs> Granddaddy, thank you for sharing with us. Would you close us out with just a prayer, thanking the yeah. Lord for 65 yeah. years of business? I will. Father, it's been such a wonderful thing that you have, have uh, allowed me to, to be in this business. Lord, I've enjoyed it. And Lord, what a thrill it was when Bob came and to me and said he was he was interested, in, and what a thrill it is to Bob and I to see Reed come in and say he's interested. And Lord, I just thank you for each one here. Lord, I love each one of them, and they know it, and I, and I do love them, Lord. And I just pray that you would just continue to keep your hand upon this business, that it would be a strong business entity in Greensboro, and Lord, we just want your will to be done. I pray for each person here, Lord, that spends their time here, that they would have a blessing and that the joy of the Lord would be in their heart. I pray for their families, and I thank you, Lord, for these 65 years and for what you're going to do in the future. Lord, we have great hope and peace in our mind because you are in control and we give you all the credit. And I just want to thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.